Jesus. Kids, you are dismissed. Go have a great time. We won't be long. Thank you, Jesus. God is so good. On a time. What's love got to do with it at H2? Everything. Aren't you grateful for God's love in your life? So grateful. Well, we're in the book of Acts. That's right. Very important. So if you have your Bible, and we really pray you do, can you open that up? Hopefully you have maybe a pen, a paper, or, or you just write something down. I want you to remember. And sometimes I'll, I'll mention verses but not necessarily have time to read them through. So I want you to make sure that you take those things and use it to study because I'm sure you're going over the message during the week, right? Yes, please. You guys should. Amen? You should. You should, and check it over and make sure and see what you see and hear and talk to each other about the Word of God. Very important. We're in the book of Acts, and we last week, just to recap, it is Acts was written by Luke, who also wrote one of the Gospels, the Gospel according to Luke. He, he writes it. He, he addresses it very similarly. And this book, uh, Luke, is a, he's a physician. He's well-educated. And he is all about eyewitnesses and facts. Everyone say eyewitnesses and facts. Yeah, maybe some of y'all should work on doing that with some of your information. Say amen. Do I look like I live on the beach and have a beach house somewhere? I do not. Eyewitnesses and facts. Did you see me build it? Go there? No. All right. That was three years ago. Lori's like, if we have a beach house that I don't know about... <laughs> But facts, important, eyewitness, and he's writing a history. The Gospel of Luke is very historical. How he lays out the details is amazing. It's full of details, very important. It doesn't say everything that happened, but it says what the Spirit of God inspired him to write that would be important for us to have. It's important, listen, to have our history. This is a problem in today's world, like you, the, the history, when we're learning that a lot of it's not accurate. Say amen. It's important to know what is the history. And for us, we get the history, not only of Jesus himself and what happened, what did he teach and what did he do, but we also get to see the history of the church that Jesus built and is building. Say amen if you're with me. And it's important because we have the very foundation of this work of God building his church and doing what he does. We have it built upon the apostles and the prophets with Jesus Christ, the cornerstone of it all. Say amen if that makes sense. And we'll see the explosive, everyone say explosive, the explosive growth of the church from about 120 people to Tens of thousands. This is within possibly a 30-year period. The book of Acts is, is written about a 30-year period. We see explosive growth. And this is without formal church buildings. This is without youth pastors. This is shocking, I know, for a lot of people, right? Without microphones, without sound systems, without advertisement billboards, without pew Bibles, without bulletins, without any of those things. We see a church alive and growing. Come on, somebody. We got we to gotta, we need to hear well the book of Acts. We need to see what the foundations, what the principles were, what the character of the people were. Y'all with me? This is very important to us kind of examining our own hearts. We see the church spreading from its center of Jerusalem out west and then covering and spreading the world. We are here sitting as a result today, hearing the gospel and believing because of the fire that started here in the book of Acts. How many people are glad for that? Amen. Yes. All over the world, the gospel is being made known all over the world. We see the transition in the book of Acts from the focus being on Israel and the Jewish people to it being on the Gentiles by the end of the book. It pushes it through. It sees the birth, the, the explosion of the Gentile world coming to Christ. We see that God has an unstoppable, redemptive plan. Look, his plan has always been, even before it says in the beginning, 
he already had this in store. Sometimes if you want to talk to Eric about time and space and how we think in time, because that's where we're at, but God is outside of it all. Someone say amen, right? Amen. He is not trapped by it. So we, we see this reality. We see God's unstoppable redemptive plan that before the foundation of the earth, he already had this all in play. Say amen with me. Let God be God today. Someone help me. I know people are stressing with that. That doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, because it's outside of your thinking. It's God. Amen. And we know that his redemptive plan was simply this, to save sinners like Mark Gittin. Say amen. And the power of the Holy Spirit uh, going forth in the preaching of the gospel. We're going to see all of this as we go into the book of Acts. We also talked about last week that there was a needed dramatic change in the disciples. The cowards, the ones who had ran, the ones that didn't understand anything. They had a dramatic change. A couple of the reasons why there was a dramatic change. First of all, there was a resurrection from the dead. Jesus was alive. That changed them for sure. How many people know that that would change any of us? It have we, we witnessed somebody getting up after three days. Come on, say amen. That, that was definitely part of their change. Also, the Bible says in Luke that their understanding was open concerning the scriptures. The Old Testament made sense to them now. For the first time, they were the first people that knew exactly what it meant. Up until then, they didn't really get the fullness of it. But now these guys understood it was all about Jesus. I, I want us to get back to preaching the Old Testament, focusing on Jesus in it. Amen? And not on ourselves, which leaves us. If you leave me at me, you left me in hopelessness. Amen. If you leave me at Jesus, you have given me everything I need. Does that make sense to anybody? Is there any saved people on this side of the room? Amen. All right. Amen. Good. Y'all still with me? So let's open our Bibles to Acts chapter 1, and we're going to read from verse 1. The former account. The former account is the book of Luke. I made O Theopolis of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. I want us to just pause there for a second. Notice that action and instruction. Isn't that supposed to be the same for us? Amen. It was not just about us in knowing something, but doing something, right? Amen. So he said that account of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. Let's follow our master in those realities too, right? Until the day in which he was taken up. Everyone say taken up. That's Jesus is saying this is all until the day. That whole account is up until the day he was taken up. Just like Elijah went up. So Jesus was going up. Amen. After he through the Holy Spirit had given commandments to the apostles. I want you to see that. He through Jesus through the Holy Spirit gave commandments to the apostles. I want you to always notice what, how, when, when we're told something about Jesus, we're going to see this, this attachment, this reality of the Holy Spirit when Jesus is doing something. And it's going to be important for you and I in a few uh, weeks as we go along to understand that combination, how important it is. The Holy Spirit had given commandments to the apostles. Apostles are sent ones. Everyone say sent ones. They're representatives. They are, the, they are the ones that they act in the interest of someone else. Does that make sense to you? Amen. The apostles, it wasn't about their opinions. No, they were sent ones that represented the one who sent them. Does somebody make sense? The apostles, those that were sent by God. And look, he says it, who God had chosen. He had chosen those apostles. And what a choice of guys that he picked. Perhaps to show how glorious he is, he picked the ones that were super unqualified, super, eh, you guys with me, right? You would never ask them to babysit your kids. Come on, say amen. Okay, but God picked them. He chose them. People have a lot of problems. God is a choosing God. Can I tell you that? For just a moment, let me just, it's, people tell me that, you know, Mark, this whole thing with salvation and God choosing and da, 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 it, I, 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 feel, I feel like it's wrong. But you know what, can I tell you, you guys make choices every day. And who are you? You choose who your friends are going to be. You choose, you choose, you know, who you're going to marry. You make a lot of choices. I think it's, it's all right for God to be God and to make choices. Amen. Just a thought. Somebody help me and say amen. amen. You're all offended. That's good. Let God be God. He chooses. He chose. He chose. He chosen. He chose it for two things. He chose, chooses to, for service, and he chooses for them to, to do what he wants them to do, right? Serve and to 
to sacrifice and salvation, all those things. This is what God, he's choosing God. So I, I love this. He chose those apostles, and those are the ones that represent not their own interests, but his. Because he chose them, he sent them. To whom he also, listen, presented himself after his suffering by many infallible proofs. Look, being seen by them during 40 days. And speaking of the things pertaining to them, the kingdom, I want you to notice this. So he gave instructions and commandments to them. I love it. Part, what was one of the commandments he gave? The Great Commission. Go and preach, right? He gave, and, and yet he actually said, go, but no, not yet, right? Amen? But he, he, he constantly gave them that instruction, but he also then presented himself over 40 days that he is alive. Everyone say he's alive very important they had to know that he was living these guys were struggling with this too i mean the, we have some verses there in the, the gospel of mark uh he tells in verse 7 in mark 16 and i'm just going to read it quick but go and tell his disciples is what the angel said and peter that he is going before you in galilee there you will see him you will do what see him right and and he says this he says you will see him as he said to you so they went quickly and they went and told them about this this jesus was here and to go meet him there verse 14 later he appeared to the 11 as they sat at the table and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen he said i they went and said jesus is alive and they said no way everyone following me very important matter of fact soldiers were bribed in the scriptures to to um, to say that disciples stole his body because so much hinged on the fact that he is alive that he is risen right amen how many people know that we're wasting our time the bible says that if he if he's still dead we are wasting our time this morning please please hear me because it's part of the gospel. The gospel is not just believing that Jesus died for your sins. The gospel also is believing that he was buried. And on the third day, he got up. Come on, church. Come on. It's very important. It's very, very important. So that's why it was big. So that's why I loved some of the scripture in there in Luke 24. This is what Jesus did. Over 40 days, he kept on meeting with them. Like, I mean, like, hey, guys, I'm back. I'm over here. I'm over here. He kept on reintroducing himself. We have one point where, where one says, can I touch everything? And he let him touch his, his hands and his feet and his side and all those things uh, because he wanted to prove to these guys that he was really alive. He wasn't a ghost. Someone say Amen. Matter of fact, we'll read Luke 24, verse 41. Look what happened. But while they still did not believe for joy and marvel, he said to them, have you any food here? This is really interesting. Check this out. Have you any food here? You got anything to eat, right? Um, Jesus could have been hungry or he could have just wanting to show them something very important. Look what happened, verse 42. So they gave him a piece of broiled fish. Hey, Amen. I'm hungry for that. And some honeycomb. Don't really know what that is, but it's there. And verse 43, and he, Jesus, did what? Took it and ate it, where at? In their presence. A ghost can't eat food. Right? So here, Jesus is showing him, I am physically alive. I really got up. Give me another piece of fish, please. Perhaps even a glorified burp at the end of it all. Amen, right? Wouldn't you want to get that? <laughs> Y'all with me, amen? So this is an important fact because his resurrection is everything. And it was the fact that they taught about Jesus being alive that many of the apostles, it was the reason for their persecution. Please hear that, right? The, the Bible says that they were greatly in the book of Acts chapter 4. If you turn a little bit further there, go ahead, turn Acts chapter 4. You'll see um, as they were presented to the priest and the, the captains of the, of, of the temple, in verse 2 of chapter 4 it says, And being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus, the resurrection from the dead the people were greatly disturbed to hear about this resurrection and it's true of the gospel when i tell people that jesus died for their sins they go oh okay and when i tell them that he was buried and on the third day he got up they're like now you lost it you lost me because the resurrection is important and vital to our belief. And so we see that even Apostle Paul, when he's standing before the, the government there, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he tells the council, look, the reason why I'm here, the reason why y'all are doing this is concerning the hope and the resurrection of the dead. I am being judged. That's why I'm being judged. It, it brought trouble on him because of that 
that wonderful thought that Jesus got up and that they were going to get up too. Say amen. amen. It was by their words, we're going to see through the whole book of Acts, it was by their words, the apostles' words, their walk, and the mighty works that they proved over and over again that he lives. Do you know it's the same true of you and me, that we are to live a life that screams Jesus is alive? There should be no such thing as a dead church. And I'm not just talking about clapping hands and live music. A people that is alive, that points, they live, they love, they serve, they worship in the reality that Jesus is alive. It's not something that just happened in the past that's gone. There's a present reality that he lives today. And that's a whole different, when we gather to worship and to praise, and when we go to work, and when we go to our homes, do we really live a life that says Jesus is alive because there's a difference and these guys lived like they really believed and saw that jesus lived again he came up out of the grave on the third day they ate with him they touched his and that's why the bible says blessed is he who believes but yet have not seen that's a verse everybody amen not a saying and so he did this he spoke with them he they seen him for 40 days and I love those 40 days, and you could do your research on all the 40s in the Bible and what happened, because there's always that little waiting time period. And he was speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Here's what he did. He did. Over the 40 days, every time he visited them and spent time with them, he would speak to them pertaining the kingdom of God. Say amen. amen. He was telling them all about this kingdom, the kingdom that had arrived, the kingdom that was coming. He was telling them all about how do I get into the kingdom of God? But by being saved. Someone say amen. Amen. It's by salvation. So guess what? This is why the church's message needs to be a clear message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, because there's no way into the kingdom of God, but through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. It's our door. Amen. Somebody have Let's clap our hands and say amen to that, because that's true. That's very, very true. There's no other way in. So now we caught up. That was our review at verse 4. Now, being assembled, he's getting into it now. That was their little kind of like, this is the pre, but here it goes. Verse 4, and being assembled together with them, he, Jesus, commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the father, which he said, you have heard from me for John, that's the Baptist, John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Not many days from now. I want you to hear some things. He, they are assembled together. They're assembled there and he is talking to them and he is giving them a command again to wait there, to not leave Jerusalem. Now, the whole book of Luke is Jesus going toward, half of the book of Luke is actually Jesus going towards Jerusalem as he's on this trip to Jerusalem. And here we have, look, Jerusalem was what? It was the place of rejection. It was the place of rejection. Here, it was supposed to be the centered place of God's presence for his people. But now it has become the city that has rejected the Messiah, rejected the Savior, right? And that very place of rejection is going to be the very birthplace of the church of Jesus Christ. I love that. I love that. That place where they they made him to be ashamed, that place that the religious people dominated over him and 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 worked so hard to to remove him and to kill him and destroy his reputation and to lie about him and to mock him that same place would be the place where god would show his stuff starting in jerusalem y'all with me still he tells them to stay there because that's where he wanted them to be and he talks about for the promise of of the father he tells them for the promise of the father stay here and they were familiar with this this promise this holy spirit this promise from the father you guys you know remember now their understanding is open listen but we know in ezekiel how many people remember that ezekiel 36 26 listen to this this is the old testament i will give you a new heart and i will put a new spirit within you And I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Right? Y'all with me? I will put my spirit within you 
and cause you to walk in my statues and you will keep my judgments and do them. Did y'all hear that? I will put my spirit in you. This is part of the promise. We hear it in Joel that in the last days he will pour out his spirit, right? Amen. Somebody hear me. This is the promise of the father. I see people looking at me. Let me, let me just explain something to you. Now, these people did not physically have stone hearts, did they? Do you have a stone heart today? No, you have a heart of flesh, right? Correct? Say amen. amen. Right? No one had a stone heart in Ezekiel. You see, this is what happens is some of us, we don't realize, but in Genesis, remember Jesus? I mean, you know, the, the father spoke and, and told him, if, you know, the day you eat of that fruit, you shall what? Sure. Yes, you're going to die. And they ate of it and they didn't drop dead. But something died. Are somebody with me? You, you see, you see, this is this is crazy because God, you know, He's creating all these animals and created. You know, animals breathe too. You guys with me? Animals breathe, right? They have lungs. They breathe, breath. Correct. God created man and He shaped and He formed them. And then then the Bible and then we think, oh, He wasn't breathing yet. Oh, no, I believe He was breathing, just like all the animals were. But this is what God did. He breathed a part of Himself in him sin into the world is gone how do i know because pentecost is nothing but a reversal of what happened in the garden of eden what died on us that day is now alive now we still have flesh under the weight and the curse of sin and therefore we will physically die but the bible look listen there's something that won't die when you die that's what we tell people. That it's important that you know that you're not just made of flesh. You may be worried about keeping this in shape, but one day that flesh is going to separate itself from your spirit. Yeah. Amen. And something will remain. And for those that believe in Jesus, the Bible says, though we die, yet shall we live. Yes. And I, I, I believe that he's saying, look, you're going to get this heart of stone replaced. This, I will put my spirit on you. Look, you're not saved if you don't have God's spirit in you. We're going to talk about that's important. And that's the same. That was what was promised. Promised. Jesus, he promised it. He, he spoke in John 7, 37. On the last day, that great day of feast, Jesus stood up and cried out, saying, he cried out. So that gives me a reason to keep yelling. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, praise God. Look at that. It's the Old Testament, right? Out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And that's not physical, correct? Amen. It's spiritual. Verse 39. But this he spoke concerning the spirit whom those believing in him would receive. Did you hear that? Those believing in him would receive the spirit. This is important. This is the life giver. This is, this is a game changer. What was lost because of sin now is gained because of Jesus. And the Father has made a promise. And y'all know he keeps his promises, right? And I'm going to read that again. Those who believe in him, they will receive that. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Did y'all hear that? Those that believe have the spirit of God. This is important. That's the life. That is us walking in newness of life. That's the reality. That's a change that happens in those that believe in Jesus as their Lord and personal Savior. Are y'all with me? But wait here for the promise. They had so much. They said, we have three good years of experience with you, Jesus. Um, oh, and we have our understanding open. Oh, we see you. You're alive. And he just says, you're still not ready yet. Because when I'm glorified, you're going to get it. You're going to get what you need. The Holy Spirit, the very Spirit of Christ. There's so many titles for the Holy Spirit in Scripture. The Spirit of Truth, the Spirit of Christ. The, all of these wonderful titles kind of display and help us understand what the Helper, the Comforter. That is, all, that is wonderful. We, we know that they're going to get something major. And here's what the Scripture keeps saying. He says this, you have heard from me 
from John, truly baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And this is important because sometimes when we hear the word baptized, we just think of, of a water or some people do sprinkling. But this word, when it comes to the Holy Spirit, it's talking about a full submersion. You're, you're going to be all, you're going to be totally covered, immersed in the Holy Spirit. That's a lot of Holy Spirit. Say amen. Yeah, you're going you're gonna to get it all. You ain't going to get a sprinkle. You're going to get all, you're going to be in. There's one baptism, in the, right? There's one reality that this is not talking about our water baptism. He said, John did it with the water, but oh, no, no, no. This is different. This is coming. This is going to be the spirit, the Holy Spirit upon you. And he says, there's going to be a delay though. He says, not many days from now, there's going to be a gap. Everyone say a gap. I just love it because I think it's really distinct. Jesus wants to make sure they see that these, how many people know that every little season and every little waiting time in our life, it, when it comes to what God's doing is very specific and very necessary. If this, he's going to show us a transfer. He's going to say, okay, now I'm going up. There's going to be this break. And then now the Holy Spirit's coming down. We're living in the age of the Holy Spirit right now. How many people know that? Jesus is not here. He is only here in the spirit, right? Amen. His spirit is here. That is the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense to anybody? We see the wonderful working. This is, this is why, I, why I have to be, be Trinitarian in my belief. We see such, such a beauty in it all. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all being played out. The Father choosing the apostles. The Father's promise. Jesus there saying, wait, and it's going to come. And the Holy Spirit is going to come. And you'll be submersed in it in a few days days. I, I get excited because you know what? They already got the instructions. They already got the commandment, but they're going to get the power in a little bit to do what God tells them they need to do. You see, we've, we've allowed different groups of people to kind of steal the Holy Spirit. And then there's a whole nother group that don't even know who he is. Come on, church. Let's be honest, right? We got the people there. Oh, oh, you mentioned Holy Spirit. People are like, oh, you know, those are little holy rollers. I heard it all back in the day. You know, hey, run around the aisles, you know, I, I know, remember towels, you know, just for the sweat. We let them hijack it, but it's for all of us, including them and us all, the Holy Spirit. And we're going to learn about it because I feel like we don't talk enough that we don't even understand what we got if you're really a believer. Amen. Or maybe what you don't got if you're not a believer. Amen. You're with me. And so they had to wait a few days. And this is for, this was going to come on everyone that believed. But we see in verse six, therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, this is what, this, so they're hearing this. They're, they're getting ready. Could you, I just want you to imagine the excitement. These guys are like, they pumped. Jesus is talking to them. He's back from the dead. This is exciting. They have command. They're getting ready to do something. And here they said to him in their excitement, I truly believe in verse six. Therefore, when they had come together, they said to him, Jesus saying, Lord, Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Isn't that crazy? They were like, it's coming. The kingdom is here. And now Israel, yes. And listen, listen to what Jesus said. He didn't say, oh, no, I'm never going to do that. I'm not going to restore. No, because there is that time and that place for that. But verse 7 says, and he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the father has put in his own authority. Did you see that? He said, it's not for you to know. They knew that there was a time on that day that God was going to raise up the tabernacle of David, which had fallen down. They knew that the restoration would come to Israel. However, they didn't know when it was, and they thought maybe it's it now. And Jesus says, it's not your business to know. It's not your business to know. That's up to the Father. That's in the Father's authority. Everybody with me? They, they said, look, this is so important for us. Get this for me. We don't still know when he's coming back. We don't know. But yet we're called to be faithful and to just do what God has called us to do. To just do what God has instructed us to do. We don't know. They didn't know. They were curious. Is it, is it happening now? And we sometimes ask ourselves the same question. Is it happening? When is Jesus coming back? But he says, it's none of your business can I tell you this? In every generation, Jesus is ready to come back. In every generation. This is how it was. In their time, they had people who they would point and say, that's, that's the Antichrist. Oh, look, look, at the, look at all the signs are all set in place. Do you know in every generation, the signs are all, it's all there because it's there? 
And you know what? For the church, when we look and see that, instead of making up some phony dates, and this drives me nuts. We recently had a guy, found, he, he eventually died. I was so, he, he kept on having, I think he had like 12 different uh, dates that Jesus was going to come again. And then he had to go tell Jesus one day. And Jesus had to say, that wasn't any of your business. Matter of fact, since you said that day, I didn't come on that day because I can't, no man can know the hour. You see, listen, in every generation, it's all ready to go. For what? The church sees it, and we were supposed to. We're not supposed to obsess. We see it, and we're like, whoa. So that we could be doing what? Remember, I, I always share that lesson. When you tell your kids what time you're coming home, you're a foolish parent. Don't ever. You tell them soon. No, I, I do that. Lord. They, they'll call because they'll check in to see. And some of my kids have my, they have my location on their phone now. And they'll call me and say, hey, where are you guys at? You know where I'm at. But they say, when are you coming home? And I, uh, John, John, I tell them all the time, soon. Why do I tell them that? Because I want them to be ready for my return. I don't want them to be acting up. I don't want them to throw that one last party. Come on, someone help me. I don't want them to not do the chores that I ask them to do. I want them to be ready for me. So, Christian, when you see the result, you see the rumors of war and war, and you see the injustice, and you see all the things happening around, and you see people worshiping somebody, and you see the, the, the universal religion rising up, and the currency, and all these things, you, look, listen, yes, he's coming, and he can come any moment. So, be prepared, be sober-minded, be on the watch. Be living and doing what it is. Be on the mission he called you to be. Don't let him come find out you sat in a church building. Come on, someone help me. Getting, we're waiting for Jesus. God forbid the book of Acts church did what many of us do in this place. Would we be experiencing the gospel right now and hear and know? Would the spread have happened had they just acted like us? Come on, church. It's real. It's real. If they would have sat around and said he's coming soon no we have to be ready when is he coming soon it's none of our business exactly when it's just our business to get ready and to be ready and to stay ready and stay alert and stay awake and and not and not let our uh, not shrink back to preach the gospel to preach the message of truth amen to walk in faith to walk a walk worthy to be an example to stand for christ no matter what that is our call to be ready our king is coming back so important he said it's not for you to know it's up to the father so just do what you're supposed to be doing and that's what he says in verse eight but you shall receive power when the holy spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in jerusalem and in all of judea and samaria and to the end of the earth that's something amazing You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Isn't it crazy that Jesus did no ministry until the heavens opened up and the Holy Spirit descended upon him? All the ministry Jesus did was empowered by the Holy Spirit himself. And guess what? All that we do should be empowered, believer, I'm I'm talking to you, by not our flesh, not our will, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. If those guys would have took what they know and say, we can work this out. We know enough. We heard Jesus do this. For three years, we heard this man preach, like, why can't we do it? I'm afraid that that same reality is a reality that's in the church. Because many, many people that, that, you know, open the word of God, you know, they, they, they get a certificate, maybe three years, maybe four, spend a lot of money, and have no walk with Christ, no, no power of the Holy Spirit, right? right? And this is why we can change what we believe and twist the doctrine. But listen, it's important to see that it wasn't their time, their three years with Jesus, that qualified them to be a witness of him. And no, 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 that, there, that was nothing in it. It was the Holy Spirit, they had to wait for it. So whatever it is that you think I can't do for God because 
No, if you have the Holy Spirit in you, I'm going to tell you, and God is calling you to something, you can do it because he will do it through you. He is the power in which we should be serving, loving, preaching, and all those things. Somebody with me. He said, look, you stay here. You wait. You wait for that power. Don't serve. Don't preach. Don't do anything until you get the Holy Spirit. It's going to come, right? Amen. And he says, you shall be witnesses. I love how that word witness is where we get the word martyr from. Martyr. Let, let me explain to this in this culture that we are in now. This is important. When we talk about being a witness, these men and this church that would rise up at the book of Acts, there was no such thing as the Christian culture. The Christian culture, there was, there was no such thing. They, they, they themselves would stick out like a sore thumb amongst all the things, the gods and all the things that were around them. And they were called to be witnesses. And isn't it crazy that each and every one of them, except for a few, all died. What looks to be a premature death on the basis of their witness for Christ. Now, I, I, w- I want us to shape this because we kind of make this just history lesson as if we're not the church of Jesus Christ that was birthed from this reality. And, and we distance ourselves and we have been on a campaign for too long. To, uh, we, we've, been, we've, we've been spoiled. I, I'm talking to the American Christian. We've been spoiled. We've been very spoiled. We have a very safe place to do our religion. But how many people know that the ship is safest in the port. But that's not what it was built for. You see, the reality of our faith, it comes when we have to be a witness for Christ. It is not about us changing the morality, going on a morality campaign around us or just trying to change the culture to match our agreement. It really is the task for us to be God's people despite everything. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they show us so well what it means to have to live in a culture that opposes your core beliefs, but yet to be able to stand when they were called to work worship the graven image the golden image they stood despite the consequences i want to talk what it means to be a witness it means to say i will stand against the culture if it goes against my belief i don't need the culture to agree with my beliefs come on church this is the radical this is why they were radically changed I'm going to be honest. This is why they didn't perhaps get as many phony Christians as what we get. Because these people meant business. This wasn't them just joining a, a nicer organization. This was really saying that now my life as a witness for Christ, my Savior, he died for me. And you know what? I will die for him if necessary. Come on, church. Hear that. That's so important. It's so important. You see, I love it. Calvin said this very clear. I love this saying that he said. He said, it is the task of the visible church to make the invisible kingdom of Christ visible. Does that make sense to you? He said, it is the task of the visible church to make the invisible kingdom of Christ visible. We are witnesses. We're to bear witnesses of Christ. Amen. And we can do that by just trying to blend in or to satisfy the popularity of the world. No, we do it by living for Jesus into the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why the power was coming, so that they could be witnesses. So when you tell me, I can't do that, I'm going to say, if you're a true believer, yes, you can. You see, for too long, we've idolized some missionaries and some people who have dared to go against government laws and all those things. We, we look at them and we go, wow, they have some amazing faith. How about they have the spirit of God that you as a believer is supposed to have? Amen. And he empowers them to be bold witnesses for Christ. What was the response of the early church in the book of Acts when they got persecuted? Was it, oh, let's hide no, let's pray for boldness because we're going back out there to do this because we got a job to do. We're on a mission. We're going to spread this message, and I love how the message is to spread. It's to start in the center of Jerusalem, the very place of rejection, and it's to go all the way to the ends 
of the earth. Thank you, Jesus, for that. It wasn't going to stay isolated. It was going to spread. And what awesome reality for us that they had to wait there and then they had to get it and they had to move out with it. We're going to even see how God used trouble and persecution to spread the gospel. You know, I was thinking as I was preparing, I was like, you know, higher hopes 21 years and we didn't make it 21 years without having some real bumps and bruises. Someone say amen. Amen. Yeah. Man, I hate conflict. How many people hate conflict? Can't stand it. But you know what? I was thinking some of the things that kind of bothered me the most and a lot of those things ended up being awesome. I'm I'm going to explain something. I was thinking about all of the church leaders that God seated here and now are doing God's work all throughout our community and beyond this place that left here because of conflict, but are being used by God outside of here to grow the kingdom left because they mad or I'm mad, right? Either one, right? Yeah, sometimes both. But I'm thankful to see that God even uses those circumstances to further it. So it's okay. Because his work's going to be done. We got to be faithful and we're going to see that. Amen. Y'all with me. We're going to close in a little bit, but let's read verse nine. And here it is. Here's the big ascension. And we're going to, we'll recap it next week, but we're going to end with it. And now when he, Jesus had spoken these things, spoke what? You're going to get what the Father promised. You're going to be baptized in a few days with the Holy Spirit, not water. You're going to get that power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You're going to be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all through the ends of the earth. He said, when he had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up. Oh, my goodness. And a cloud received him out of their sight. Y'all saw me on my tippy toes going up, Lord. That would be amazing if that happened to me right now. It would be amazing. My head be stuck in the ceiling towel. (laughs) He would be taken up and a cloud receive him. Forty days, they saw this resurrected one. He taught them. He gave them instruction. And he made sure that this event was very important. He wanted them to see him going up. Yes. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven... As he went up, behold, two men stood by him, them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing into the heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Now, I want you to, I want to hear this. They were like looking up. He was gone and they're still staring up to the heavens. Had they waited and remained looking up, there would be no worldwide spread. The movement wouldn't be what it is. He said, don't keep looking up there. This is the message that the two said, don't stand there just gazing. Let your hearts know that this Jesus who went up is coming back. Now listen, this, people say, what was the motivation of these men? Was that they were told that Jesus was coming back and they didn't know when. I mean, they saw clouds all the time. To them, it had to be a reminder that Jesus is coming back and it's not time for us to look and wait like this, but it's time for us to be obedient. You see, part of the character of the apostles and of the church in the book of Acts, you'll see real strongly, there was a dedication and there was a real obedience. He said, stay here and don't leave Jerusalem. They stayed there and didn't leave. He said, wait for the Spirit to come. They waited for the Spirit to come. They were clothed in obedience. Those that were disobedient before now were obedient They followed what God said to do. And oh, the results 
we are living in the results. God's redemptive plan has reached us. Thank you, Jesus. The gospel has found us. The grace of God has been poured on us. And we are thankful today. We are the ends of the earth. We are the people that have received the blessing. It has lasted years and years and years and years under all sorts of the gospel message has survived it all. Why? Because it's unstoppable. Men have tried to change it and twist it. But, oh, the true gospel of Jesus Christ continues to find its way to the center and to the hearts of people all over the world. In every language, crossing boundaries, places where it's illegal. The gospel is there. Why? The power of God is going forth. Men full of the Holy Spirit and women full of the Holy Spirit are taking Bibles across the battlefields for Jesus. Why? Because the Spirit of God came down and they became witnesses. I'm going to tell you this. It wasn't an optional transformation. You didn't get to choose to be a witness. If he chose you and you believed and you were born again, you got the Holy Spirit and you are a witness. Perhaps the only question today is what kind of witness are you? Church, I feel like I could say this. When you read the book of Acts, all I keep hearing is tag, you're it. It's your turn. The foundation has been built. The cornerstone's in place. Now, come on. What history, what chapter 29 of Acts, don't look it for it, it's not there. What chapter 29 is being written of us at Higher Hope? Are we faithful witnesses of Jesus Christ, of his death, his burial, his resurrection, and his coming again? Are we kingdom preaching, telling people that the kingdom of heaven, about the kingdom of God, about the plan of God, the salvation, the, his redemptive plan? Are we shrinking back? Are we altering it? Are we being bold and courageous people filled with the spirit of God? Amen. Those that are fully fully changed and transformed. That's the book of Acts. It's, it's giving us, it's, it's telling us where we came from. It's telling us how this all started. You see, I want to be a part of what God is doing. How about you? And every true believer should be a part of what God is doing. We're supposed to be people on a mission to make Jesus Christ known. You know, I used to think my job was to save people, but there's, that's not our job. We can't save people. We're not called to that. We're called to faithfully preach the message of Christ. Faithfully, clearly, boldly, no matter what. Because truly, it's the only message, the only message that will either be a sweet smell to those being saved or a rotten odor to those who are perishing. But either way, let it be heard. What would your life look like if you really believe the message you heard today? How different would your family, your neighborhood, this community be if you believe what you heard today? Would we turn this place upside down or would we be upside down with the place? Thank you, Jesus. I don't know about you, but look, if you believe in Jesus Christ, you truly believe you have the Holy Spirit today. The promise of the Father. And I'm thankful today because it, my life has changed and your lives are changed because of the presence of the Holy Spirit in you and in me. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Jesus, for your gift and your promise being fulfilled. Let us be witnesses, strong and bold, Letting the world know that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. Amen. Come on, let's give God praise. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, give the Lord some praise. Thank you, Jesus.